Hello everyone, and welcome to Orthodox Shahada. I'm Kai, and this is a video presentation on the topic of prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse in Islam. Before I begin, I would just like to say that you all have my explicit permission to freely disseminate this video, to upload it to your YouTube channels, or whatever platforms you may use. There is no need to ask for permission. I'm preemptively giving everyone permission to use this video unrestricted. This presentation is mainly about two things. To provide conclusive proof that prepubescent marriage is legally permissible in Islam, and to provide conclusive proof that prepubescent sexual intercourse is legally permissible in Islam. What this presentation is not about is giving a moral and ethical appraisal of prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse. My focus in this presentation is not to judge these practices. Rather, I am providing evidence as to their occurrences and permissibility in Islam. The motivation for this presentation is to get Muslims to stop lying that prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse does not represent authentic Islam. That said, I am anticipating particular responses to this presentation from Muslims. And in this regard, I am wholeheartedly prepared to follow up with another presentation, if need be, to address any so-called rebuttals. So what are the kinds of responses Muslims may potentially provide? Well, despite that I am specifically avoiding making moral and ethical judgments in this presentation, I do expect that Muslims will attempt to deflect and reframe the matter as an issue of morality and ethics by presenting a tu quoque fallacy. Namely, they will attempt to point out supposed prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse in the Bible, for example, Isaac and Rebecca, or otherwise appeal to various similar non-Muslim historical cultural practices. Muslims might claim that Arabian girls reached puberty at a much earlier age than girls in the rest of the world. But this is just a cope masquerading as a claim with absolutely no evidence whatsoever. It's just like the supposed Islamic miracle of the moon splitting. No one saw it because it was late at night and everyone was sleeping. No evidence to substantiate the claim. Muslims might try and put forward the argument that when the particular hadith involving Aisha says six, it really means sixteen. Seven really means seventeen, nine really means nineteen, and that eighteen really means twenty-eight. Basically, that the text doesn't say what it clearly says. I will address this point in this presentation. Muslims might propose the idea that Muhammad waiting until Aisha reached nine until consummating the marriage suggests that he waited until she reached sexual maturity. On the face of it, that actually does sound like a legitimate claim. But I'll demonstrate in this presentation why this claim doesn't pan out. Muslims may purposefully conflate maturity with intellectual discernment, claiming that Aisha was mature in that she could intellectually discern, and that this type of discernment occurs in adulthood. So the reasoning is that the consummation of her marriage to Muhammad occurred when she was already pubescent. I will demonstrate that this claim, namely that maturity is synonymous with intellectual discernment, is absolute nonsense. Muslims might cite minority opinions as if they carry the same kind of weight as an entire established school of jurisprudence. For example, think of it like being analogous to trying to convince someone that the opinion of a single lawyer carries more weight than that of the Supreme Court. Are we really going to take such a person seriously? Now multiply that idea of a Supreme Court by four to represent the four recognized schools in Sunni Islam. You have this one solitary lawyer against four judicial bodies that are all in agreement with each other. And this hits on an issue that Muslims typically don't understand. Just because some scholar in history expressed a particular view or opinion, that doesn't automatically mean it is correct 
or to be followed, that it somehow falls under the idea of diversity being a mercy from Allah. Take, for example, Imam Shafi'i, after whom we have the Shafi'i school. After his sojourn in Egypt, he invalidated most of his earlier positions that he held while in Iraq because he came to be aware of additional authentic traditions in Egypt that he was not aware of while in Iraq. These new hadiths, in his opinion, necessitated a re-evaluation of the evidences for his rulings. Nonetheless, for various jurisprudential reasons, the Shafi'i school itself as a body does on occasion prefer some of the older Iraqi positions, despite that Shafi'i himself abandoned those positions. There's a methodology at play for both Shafi'i himself as well as the school that bears his name. The point is that just because historically someone may have had an opinion at some time doesn't mean it automatically has any weight. That opinion might have been limited in the evidence that was considered, it might have resulted in faulty application of evidence, or it might rely on evidence that shouldn't be accepted. Muslims might dismiss the legal requirement to follow a particular school of Islamic jurisprudence. In so doing, they are basically throwing their scholars under the bus under the pretense of fallibility and claiming that every Muslim can freely interpret the Qur'an and Sunnah directly themselves, that they have the liberty to pick and choose what to accept and what to reject. I'll address this point in this presentation. Muslims may also attempt at character assassination, namely questioning my competency in usul al-fiqh, al-ahkam, al-mu'atamad, al-fatawa, and or Arabic. They might try to portray the evidence that I present as not actually saying what it does actually say, and or that it's not meant to be interpreted in the way I'm presenting it, that I'm presenting things out of context. Or they may even just simply classify me as an Islamophobe and on that basis alone refuse to engage the evidence. Some Muslims might be honest about Islam and actually agree with me that I really am presenting authentic Islam. These Muslims are likely to also be the type that don't shy away from saying that the West is Dar al-Harb and it's only a matter of time before the Kufar either become Muslim or are killed or made the dhimis under an Islamic caliphate. That there's nothing to be ashamed of when it comes to prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse, such as the will of Allah. The entire issue of prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse in Islam revolves around the so-called Aisha Hadith. There are several versions of this Hadith, and I have referenced them on this slide. They do differ slightly from each other, but more or less all point to the same idea. The quintessential one is from Sahih al-Bukhari, Hadith number 5133, and it is the one I explicitly quote here. This hadith says, Narrated Aisha that the Prophet married her when she was six years old and he consummated his marriage when she was nine years old and then she remained with him for nine years, i.e. till his death. It is this hadith and the others like it that is the basis for the proliferation of legal rulings supportive of prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse in Islamic law. However, and this is a big however, hadiths like this on their own don't provide much context how exactly they can be acted upon in a legal framework. And the key concept here is legal. For example, is the hadith suggesting a pattern of conduct for all Muslims to emulate? Or was it a practice reserved strictly for Muhammad and no one else? Do the ages of 6 and 9 delineate explicit limits? Or do we need to take into consideration things like taklif, or legal responsibility, namely being Muslim, having reached puberty, and possessing intellectual discernment? The point here is that at face value, the hadith has very limited 
practical usage. It's the scholars of fiqh, or jurisprudence, who are the ones that scrutinized the hadith to extract all the possible information they could and apply that in forming rulings. In other words, develop the fiqh, the jurisprudence, to be the real-world implementation of the divinely ordained sharia, or Islamic law. In order to better understand how such a hadith fits into all of this, we first need to understand what sharia and fiqh are and how they differ. Without being overly pedantic, broadly speaking, sharia is the divinely ordained, overarching principle, whereas fiqh is the multi-layered, detailed, implemented expression of sharia. The following example will illustrate the point. Sharia is that marriage is a divinely ordained injunction. It comes from Allah in the Quran, namely Surah 4 verse 3 and Surah 24 verse 32. Connected to this is the relevant fiqh, or the details of how marriage is implemented. For example, primary level of fiqh would be in order for marriage to be legal, it requires a valid contract. Secondary level of fiqh would be in order for the contract to be valid, there must be the bridegroom, the bride, the bride's guardian, two witnesses, and the verbal phrases of offer and acceptance. Some at this point might say, why not include the dowry as well in this list? Well, the reply could be that the dowry is not essential to the contract in and of itself. Then you have tertiary level of fiqh. Do the two witnesses have to be males, or is it permissible to have one male and two females? Do the witnesses have to be upright or not? Can the verbal phrases of offer and acceptance be in a language that the witnesses cannot understand? In what instances can the bride's grandfather be her guardian if her father is still alive? And now this last question starts entertaining side issues like whether or not her father is still a mukallif. Perhaps he went insane, or there remains the question of whether or not he's still alive, having gone to fight in jihad. Or maybe he apostatized and is no longer Muslim. All of these side questions are absolutely relevant and they all have their own respective layers of fiqh. For example, if the father went insane, is there a possibility that he will regain his sanity? And if so, does the bride have to wait? If the father is away at jihad, then what is the length of time to wait for him to return? If the father is an apostate, then must the bride wait three days to see if her father will return to Islam or if he will be executed. Then we have quaternary level of fiqh. What if the bride has no male relatives alive to be her guardian? If she was a slave at one point in her life, then does she first have to seek out her emancipator or can she go directly to the magistrate at this point to seek guardianship? Or does she go to the sultan? Or is it permissible for her to seek out a male Muslim from the general ummah? In other words, fiqh is a massive cobweb-like network. Everything is connected somehow. Everything. So if you arbitrarily change something in the fiqh chain, then it can have a ripple effect leading to devastating repercussions to the point of possibly jeopardizing Sharia itself. It's not about just changing this one little teeny tiny ruling in fiqh. That change can be the beginning of a tsunami or avalanche as the domino effect cascades. Knowing that hadiths are intricately used in fiqh allows one to navigate this network and immediately call out BS when Muslim apologists misinterpret and misapply hadiths, consciously or otherwise. Knowing fiqh, one can demonstrate the repercussions. So a debate on hadith actually leads to a much larger debate, namely scrutinizing sharia itself. Within fiqh, there is what is known as the 
Mu'atamad position. This is the de facto position within a madhab, or jurisprudential school. In Sunni Islam, you have four recognized schools, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali. By Mu'atamad is meant reliable, dependable, trustworthy, authentic, authoritative. In other words, it's quite simply the safe, go-to position of a school. It's what the scholars of the school have deemed to be guidance. You will not be in error. You will not go wrong if you follow the Mu'atamad position. Intricately related to the notion of Mu'atamad is Ijma, or consensus. The Mu'atamad position may or may not technically constitute Ijma because ijma requires specific jurisprudential criteria to be satisfied. The Mu'atamad position may be equivalent to ijma in one school, but might, but might not be ijma in another school because the jurisprudential criteria establishing ijma are different between the two. Also, it is important to understand that the Mu'atamad position is an authentic expression of sharia, not to be dismissed on a whim. It is guidance from Allah. It is what the community relies on when training its scholars and jurists. After 14 centuries of Islam, what methodology do you think the Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali schools use to train their jurists? Do you think the imams and sheikhs say to their students, just go and read Quran and Sunnah and do your own ijtihad? Here you go, Walid. Here's your first court case. Amina was married to Zaid last week. Everyone thought that Amina's father died fighting in jihad, but he just came back yesterday and he disapproves of the marriage and is now petitioning the court to have it annulled. Go ahead, Walid. Use Quran and Sunnah to make a decision, Ahi. May Allah guide you. Of course, every reasonable person is going to say such an approach is nonsensical. Rather, Students learn from their teachers who learned from their teachers who learned from their teachers and so on and so forth for 14 centuries. Take another example. If you have a relative who passes away and leaves behind an inheritance, are you going to say, hold on everyone, we can't proceed with distribution of the inheritance just yet. I have to first go and read Quran and Sunnah to make sure it's done correctly. And then what do you do when 10 other family members all say, hey, that's a good idea. Let's all go and read Quran and Sunnah to find out what we need to do. In other words, everyone is going to go and do their own ijtihad. And then what do you do when everyone comes to different understandings and the inheritance cannot be distributed to everyone's liking? Or take even the burial itself. Are you going to have multiple family members all say, hold on, we can't bury him just yet. We have to first go to the Quran and Sunnah and determine what's the proper way. Of course, no normal person is going to behave like this. A normal person calls their imam or sheikh when someone dies, the burial is arranged, and the person is buried. Then the inheritance is distributed and everyone moves on with their lives. People follow what the imam or sheikh says because being scholars, they already spent the time to go through all the details of the Quran and Sunnah. So this mindset that every single Muslim in the world is expected to go directly to Quran and Sunnah themselves for every single issue and perform their own ijtihad is absolute nonsense and impractical for a functioning society. So when you ask a Muslim, what madhab do you follow? And they respond, I don't follow a madhab. I go directly to the Quran and Sunnah. Then that's your indication that you're dealing with someone who lacks mental competency when it comes to Islam. The Mu'atamad positions have the backing of thousands upon thousands of scholars 
over hundreds and hundreds of years who have worked together to scrutinize the nuances in order to arrive at rulings using precise principles of jurisprudential investigation of the Quran and Sunnah. And in this process, the corpus of Hadith has been vigorously and thoroughly appraised for us by these jurists. That's what constitutes the Mu'atamad position. It's a distillation and setting down in codified form all of the principled investigative work of specialized jurists. And the key word here is principled. So anyone who themselves is not a qualified jurist yet dismisses legal positions recognized as Mu'atamad exhibits an extremely high degree of arrogance and stupidity. Moreover, just because the Mu'atamad position may not technically constitute ijma in certain instances, nonetheless, it still has the full weight behind it as being guidance from Allah. A significant advantage of using the Mu'atamad approach is it bypasses our personal hadith appraisals. The jurisprudential body of an entire school does the appraisal for us. That body of scholars is telling us that the binding legal rulings were established precisely because the respective hadiths were not considered daif, or weak and discardable, irrespective of what individual scholars might think. Perhaps in the early days of Islam, rulings were subject to change as the corpus of Hadith literature was yet to be firmly established and authenticated. But if the Muslim Ummah is still debating the authenticity of Hadiths 14 centuries later, then that just goes to show how fallacious the whole idea of Usul al-Hadith really is. The Muslim apologist has a serious problem on his hands if he invokes the argument that such and such hadith is da'if if that particular hadith is used to establish fiqh recognized as mu'tamad. It would be tantamount to challenging an entire madhab. It literally amounts to the accusation that the madhab is misguided and anyone following that madhab is also misguided. So invoking the da'if argument potentially has a very serious price tag for the Muslim apologist. He potentially ends up undermining the entirety of usul al-fiqh and usul al-hadith, thereby indirectly implying that the entirety of Islamic law is arbitrary. Without the backing of the various Mu'tamad positions, Muslims can manipulate hadiths to no end. But when fiqh, or jurisprudence, comes into play, that's demonstration how Muslim scholars themselves have been understanding and using these hadiths. And the stakes are now much higher for the Muslim apologist since he now risks compromising his own position. Let's take a look at what constitutes ijma in the Shafi'i school. Quote, Scholarly consensus is the agreement of all the mujtahids of the Muslims existing at one particular period after the Prophet's death about a particular ruling regarding a matter or event. It may be gathered from this that the integral elements of scholarly consensus are four, without which it is invalid. A. That a number of mujtahids exist at a particular time. B. That all mujtahids of the Muslims in the period of the thing or event agree on its ruling, regardless of their country, race, or group, though non-mujtahids are of no consequence. C. That each mujtahid present his opinion about the matter in an explicit manner, whether verbally, by giving a formal legal opinion on it, or practically, by giving a legal decision in a court case concerning it. D. And that all mujtahids agree on the ruling, 
for if a majority of them agree, consensus is not affected, no matter how few those who contradict it, nor how many those who concur. End quote. An example of ijma is the legal basis for marriage. Quran, Sunnah, and ijma. Now, why is ijma cited with regards to marriage? As mentioned earlier, marriage is clearly indicated in the Quran. Is it not enough to just cite Quran and Sunnah? The reason why ijma is cited in addition to Quran and Sunnah is to prevent tampering with Sharia. You'll see it in the fiqh books where ijma is also cited alongside Quran and Sunnah as a legal basis for things like Hajj and many other common practices in Islam. It may seem odd to cite ijma for things so central to Islam, but really the reason is to prevent tampering of these components of Sharia. When it comes to marriage, there exists precedent for revoking something that was once legally acceptable. For example, muta marriage. So in order to prevent the legality of marriage itself in a broader context from being revoked, ijma is cited. I'll get to the reasons in a moment why exactly ijma provides safeguards. The early days of Islam suffered from a proliferation of fabricated hadiths. It was commonplace for people to fabricate them for personal gain. In fact, the overwhelming majority of hadiths ever recorded were fabricated. Bukhari and Muslim sifted through hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of hadiths, the overwhelming majority of which were fabricated. People in those days could be swayed by fabricated hadiths, even if they contradicted the Qur'an. After all, not only did the Qur'an abrogate previous divine revelations, but it abrogated parts of itself. So the idea of abrogation would not be something new for Muslims. In the early days of Islam, it would not be difficult to use a fabricated hadith to convince the common person who probably couldn't read and didn't have access to the Qur'an that marriage in general has been abrogated, just how muta marriage was abrogated. There are a whole host of reasons why people would want to abolish marriage altogether. For example, pagan Arab society was highly adulterous. The existence of muta marriage is a testament to this, and you readily see muta marriage in the Hadith literature. So a society that was entrenched in muta marriage to no longer have it, the next option would be to just eliminate the concept of marriage altogether. This is just one example. It's not difficult to think of others. And this is where ijma comes in to prevent stuff like eliminating marriage altogether from happening. Just before I talk about how, let me also mention that ijma is a safeguard against present, or what was present at that time, and future deviant jurisprudential methodologies. For example, modern-day so-called Salafis, who constantly stress Qur'an and Sunnah, Qur'an and Sunnah, Qur'an and Sunnah, to the exclusion of everything and everyone else, that they will consult the Qur'an and Sunnah directly themselves as if every Salaf is his own mujtahid. Individual Salafis arrogate to themselves this idea that Allah will guide them personally in their evaluation of Qur'an and Sunnah. When in fact, what the Salaf risks doing in his strive for purity is to incorrectly understand the Qur'anic verses and also misapply hadiths and possibly end up abrogating something that, in fact, constitutes sharia. The Salafi mindset exhibits a proclivity for error. The so-called Salaf, while desiring to return to the early era of Islam, 
is short-sighted in his thinking and does not understand the political and religious climate of that era that he so desperately wants to return to. He can't fathom the wisdom behind Ijma, Mu'tamad, and Usul al-Fiqh, as elaborated by a madhab. By invoking Ijma, the general idea of the validity of marriage is forever enshrined as Sharia. Anything that is considered Ijma can never be overturned. Quote, when the four necessary integrals of consensus exist, the ruling agreed upon is an authoritative part of sacred law that is obligatory to obey and not lawful to disobey. Nor can mujtahids of a succeeding era make the thing an object of new ijtihad because the ruling on it, verified by scholarly consensus, is an absolute legal ruling which does not admit of being contravened or annulled. The proof of the legal authority of scholarly consensus is that just as Allah Most Glorious has ordered the believers in the Qur'an to obey Him and His Messenger, so too He has ordered them to obey those of authority among them, saying, O you who believe, obey Allah and obey the Prophet and those of authority among you. Qur'an 4.59 such that when those of authority and legal expertise, the mujtahids, agree upon a ruling, it is obligatory in the very words of the Qur'an to follow them and carry out their judgment. And Allah threatens those who oppose the messenger and follow other than the believer's way, saying, Whoever controverts the messenger after guidance has become clear to him and follows other than the believer's way. We shall give him over to what he has turned to and roast him in hell and how evil an outcome. Quran 4, 115. End quote. So you see, Ijma is meant to put safeguards in place to prevent people from tampering with certain aspects of Sharia. Once something is deemed to be ijma, then it's part of Islam forever. But now here comes the irony. There is no ijma among Muslims as to what constitutes ijma. Some things that other schools have as criteria for ijma that differ from the Shafi'i school are, for example, one, ijma sukuti, or Silent ijma. This type of ijma does not require an explicit statement or action on the part of mujtahids. Remaining silent on an issue that is being debated by the more vocal mujtahids is taken as a sign of passive acceptance of the majority opinion. That these silent mujtahids are not opposed to the majority position their silence is taken as approval. So this lowers the threshold compared to the Shafi'i school as to what can be considered ijma. Or two, restricting ijma to just the Sahaba or companions of Muhammad. So no subsequent generation of Muslims can ever establish ijma. Or three, ijma may be considered regionalized. So the opinions of mujtahids from the entire Muslim ummah is not required. For example, the consensus of only the mujtahids of Medina is sufficient, or the consensus of only the mujtahids of Kufa is sufficient. In other words, the exact same issue can be considered to have the backing of ijma in one school, while not in another. Nonetheless, Ijma or not, the Mu'atamad position is still to be regarded as guidance from Allah. And that's the key point. Now that we have a better understanding of Ijma, let's look at the consequences of not abiding by Ijma in those cases where it is established to have occurred. Quote, Acts 
that entail leaving Islam. Point seven, to deny any verse of the Quran or anything which by scholarly consensus belongs to it or to add a verse that does not belong to it, end quote. So rejecting a Quranic verse, rejecting the scholarly consensus how to understand that verse, and rejecting anything that is connected to it, in other words, the relevant sharia and fiqh, is an act that entails leaving Islam. It is an act of kufr, disbelief, and rida, apostasy. With regards to Quranic verses, there are three layers of ijma to establish the verse as constituting part of the Qur'an, to establish the agreed-upon meaning of the verse, and to establish the relevant fiqh deriving from the verse and its agreed-upon meaning. A little later, we'll look at an example of this with regards to Surah 65, verse 4, by Ibn Qudama in his al muqni on prepubescent marriage. First, I want to flesh out some other preliminary things. Rejecting ijma is an act that constitutes kufr, or disbelief, and rida, or apostasy. It means that the person has left Islam. As a Muslim, one is not allowed to reject ijma. Any Muslim who rejects ijma puts himself in kufr and rida. There is no disputing this. Rejecting ijma is an act of kufr. It is an act of rida. Such a person becomes a kafir, a disbeliever, and a murtad, an apostate. The legal consequences of apostasy are as follows. Quote, When a person who has reached puberty and is sane voluntarily apostatizes from Islam, he deserves to be killed. In such a case, it is obligatory for the caliph, or his representative, to ask him to repent and return to Islam. If he does, it is accepted from him, but if he refuses, he is immediately killed. If he is a free man, no one besides the caliph or his representative may kill him. If someone else kills him, the killer is disciplined for arrogating the caliph's prerogative and encroaching upon his rights, as this is one of his duties. There is no indemnity for killing an apostate or any expiation, since it is killing someone who deserves to die. End quote. Therefore, the main consequence of rejecting the Mu'atamad position is whether or not this puts one in disbelief and deserving of capital punishment, since in this instance, rejecting the Mu'atamad position is to reject what was established as ijma, or it puts one in deviance, wherein one is still within the fold of Islam, since in this instance, rejecting the Mu'atamad position amounts to rejecting guidance, but not rejecting ijma in the technical sense. I will soon demonstrate that prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse is an area where the four Sunni schools, namely Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali, concur with each other in their Mu'tamad positions as to their acceptance of these practices. As such, the schools are deemed guided. Now, would anyone deny the lawfulness of marriage itself in a broader context, they would most certainly be considered a disbeliever, according to the legal definition of ijma, and as a result, subject to capital punishment. However, denying the validity of the permissibility of prepubescent marriage and or prepubescent sexual intercourse may or may not warrant capital punishment. But the overarching point I want to emphasize is that whether or not the Mu'tamad position on an issue constitutes ijma in a technical sense is actually not of immediate concern. Rather, a position being Mu'tamad of the four schools is enough to establish that the position is guidance from Allah. Whether one is to be executed for rejecting that guidance is ultimately immaterial to the discussion, as it 
really is a moot point. Being executed for disbelief or being allowed to live, albeit considered a deviant, still results in the punishment of hellfire. And this highlights the main point that I will be making in this presentation, namely that prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse represents authentic Islam and is to be considered guidance from Allah. Which gets us to the next topic. Sharia is divinely ordained. Quote, There is no disagreement among the scholars of the Muslims that the source of legal rulings for all the acts of those who are morally responsible is Allah most glorious. Also, a second evidentiary aspect is that a ruling agreed upon by all the mujtahids in the Islamic community, Ummah, is in fact the ruling of the community, represented by its mujtahids. And there are many hadiths that have come from the Prophet, Allah bless him and give him peace, as well as quotes from the companions which indicate that the community is divinely protected from error, including his saying, Allah bless him and give him peace. My community shall not agree on an error. Allah is not wont to make my community concur on misguidance. That which the Muslims consider good, Allah considers good. End quote. We also have the following authentic hadith recorded by Ibn Majah. The children of Israel split into 71 sects, and my nation will split into 72, all of which will be in hell apart from one, which is the main body. We also have the following authentic hadith recorded by Muslim. One who found in his Amir something which he disliked should hold his patience. For one who separated from the main body of the Muslims, even to the extent of a hand span, and then he died, would die the death of one belonging to the days of Jahaliya, or ignorance, Islamic ignorance. So all these sources are pointing to the same thing. Islam is not yours to invent or to mold to your liking. The idea is that you are not at liberty to change something in Islam just because you may dislike it. Rather, you are the one who has to change in order to conform to Islam. Muhammad came to convey to Muslims the religion of Islam. He didn't give the Muslim ummah Lego blocks and tell every Muslim to go play and build whatever version of Islam they want. There is a degree of leniency so that the community doesn't fracture as a result of being overly rigid, but certain fundamental aspects of Islam cannot be subject to personal desires. Furthermore, as the Qur'an tells us in Surah 33, verse 21, quote, There has certainly been for you in the Messenger of Allah an excellent pattern for anyone whose hope is in Allah in the last day and who remembers Allah often. End quote. Within the framework of fiqh, the issue is not about the moral or ethical appraisal of what Muhammad may have done, but rather it is about whether or not the narration of what Muhammad is attributed as having done, what we call the sunnah, is trustworthy and authentic and to what degree because this is what determines if and how it can be used to establish Islamic law. The immediate concern of the Muslim jurist is not to appraise whether what is conveyed by the hadith as good or bad, as moral or immoral, as ethical or unethical. The overriding concern for Muslim jurists is whether or not the supposed acts by Muhammad constitute sunnah in order that they be emulated and legal rulings be established. So Muslims are not to invent their own versions of Islam. Rather, they are to follow the guidance that is the sunnah of Muhammad. And I really want to emphasize this point. 
because anyone who deals with Muslims at an apologetics level readily knows that pretty much every single Muslim will give you a different version of Islam. They hide behind this notion that diversity is a mercy from Allah in order to deflect a particular problematic position, failing to discriminate that the mercy is with regards to issues like in the opening Allahu Akbar for prayer, do you raise your hands to ear level or shoulder level? Do you fold your arms above the navel or below the navel during prayer? Or maybe you let them hang at your sides. The idea here is to not fracture the Muslim ummah over minor inconsequential details. These are the kinds of things where diversity is a mercy from Allah. However, when it comes to the issue of prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse, these are not minor inconsequential details. These kinds of things have major repercussions for the people and families involved. These have major repercussions for Islamic society as a whole. These kinds of things are what constitute the very fabric of Islamic society. Dismissal and manipulation of them are not to be taken lightly. There is no notion of diversity being a mercy from Allah on these kinds of issues. So Muslims cannot just take up nonsense positions because they want to win a debate at Speaker's Corner. Islamic society is not going to be impacted by where you place your hands during prayer, but it will be impacted by whether or not it permits prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse. With that, we've laid the groundwork to finally now examine the Aisha Hadith. Imam Nawawi provides us with the quintessential understanding of the set of hadiths comprising the narrative of Aisha's marriage to Muhammad and its consummation. Specifically, Imam Nawawi, in what is considered by Muslims to be the most celebrated Islamic commentary on Sahih Muslim, published in 18 volumes, comments on one of the versions found in Sahih Muslim. To my knowledge, there doesn't yet exist an English translation of this particular commentary in a scholarly publication of Imam Nawawi's work. So I present here my own personal translation from the Arabic. I cite the Arabic publication and provide you with the exact Arabic text so anyone can verify that indeed my translation is accurate and faithful to the Arabic original. This is what Imam Nawawi writes. As for the young girl's marriage ceremony and the consummation of it, if the husband and the guardian agree on something that does not harm the young girl, then it, the consummation, may be done. If they, the husband and the guardian, disagree, then Ahmad, i.e. Ibn Hanbal, and Abu Ubaid said, a girl of nine years is compelled to it, the consummation of the marriage without her consent, but this is not applicable if she is younger. Malik, Shafi'i and Abu Hanifa said, the limit of consummation is to endure the intercourse without harm, which varies among girls, so no age limit is set. This is the correct position. There is no age limitation in the Hadith of Aisha, nor is there prohibition for the one who can endure it before the age of nine nor is permission necessary for the virgin when she is nine and is unable. Dawoodi said, Aisha had a good youth, may Allah be pleased with her. So Imam Nawawi explicitly and unambiguously tells us how Shafi'i, Malik, 
Abu Hanifa and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the very founders of the four recognized schools of Sunni Islam, all understood the Aisha Hadith. Just to be clear with regard to the Hanbali position, Imam Nawawi is not saying that Ibn Hanbal is a priori against prepubescent sexual intercourse before the age of nine. Rather, Ibn Hanbal is setting a limit in the event that the husband and guardian cannot come to an agreement. Otherwise, if the guardian has no objection to the prepubescent consummation, then the act is acceptable by Ibn Hanbal. The overriding concern is not that the girl is prepubescent, but rather to maintain her bodily integrity so as not to be physically harmed as a result of being penetrated. In other words, Islamic law does not entertain the girl's prepubescence in and of itself as grounds for disallowing sexual intercourse. The concern is with whether or not the prepubescent girl can endure penetration without harm. And the counter-argument to equate physical endurance with pubescence doesn't work because it is possible that one can have reached pubescence yet still not be able to physically endure sexual intercourse. Moreover, Ibn Hanbal's imposition of nine years of age, is absolutely arbitrary with regards to pubescence. Perhaps some girls will have reached pubescence by nine, while others will have not. So the imposition of nine certainly cannot be understood as meaning that pubescence is the deciding factor. Rather, nine is taken because that's how old Aisha was, plain and simple. Furthermore, this specific topic in fiqh is one of the rare instances where the argument from silence actually is acceptable. Namely, if prepubescent sexual intercourse was a priori not permissible, then it will be grounds for divorce, at which point the bride's guardian would be able to intervene. No such law is elaborated in fiqh for the express reason that if the guardian and bridegroom agree to the consummation while the girl is prepubescent, as we see in Imam Nawawi's commentary, then the act is licit. Now, someone may bring up the argument that endurance being a condition for sexual intercourse is evidence of morality and ethics. This entails a whole other discussion, not of immediate concern for this presentation. But suffice it to say, no, this is not evidence in support of a positive moral and ethical appraisal. Rather, it is strictly about preserving the girl's bodily integrity so that she will be able to reproduce at some point in the future when she is pubescent. A moral and ethical appraisal would entail investigating things like the girl's silence as an indication of consent, and sexual intercourse with a minor, namely someone who is not able to reproduce, so that the sexual act is solely performed for the gratification of the man. I'm not making any appraisals of these things here. I'm just pointing out the kinds of things that such a discussion would entail with regards to morality and ethics. What Muslim apologists typically stay away from discussing is how the relevant hadiths have been historically understood by Muslims themselves and used by Muslim scholars and jurists for 14 centuries in establishing fiqh, as we see in the case of Imam Nawawi. When one looks at the evidence that we find in the fiqh of all four recognized Sunni schools, namely Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, and Hanbali, we see unanimous and unambiguous agreement among the schools that Islamic law does indeed permit both prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse. Now, Why is Imam Nawawi important that we should listen to him? 
it's because she holds the strongest position in the Shafi'i school and is highly respected by the Muslim ummah at large, Shafi'i or otherwise. Quote, Jalal Bulkaini relates from his father, Siraj ad-Din, that the soundest position in the Shafi'i school for court rulings and formal legal opinions, fatwa, in order of which must be accepted first when available, is what Nawawi and Rafi'i agree upon, then Nawawi's position, then Rafi's, then what has been judged strongest by the majority of scholars, then by the most knowledgeable, then by the most God-fearing. Our Sheikh Ibn Hajar Haitami states that this is what has been agreed upon by the most exacting of the later scholars and is the position our Sheikhs have enjoined us to rely on. End quote. In other words, Imam Nawawi is at the pinnacle of Sunni Islamic jurisprudence. He is a pillar of fiqh. Now we will examine the Mu'tamad positions from sources within each of the four schools. These are not the only Mu'tamad sources that exist. There are plenty out there for each school. I selected these in particular because in addition to being well-respected in their own rights, they are readily accessible to the English speaker, except for Al-Mukhni for the Hanbali school. The fact that the other three works were chosen as primary candidates for translation by Muslims above other existing Mu'tamad sources speaks to their prominence in the Muslim mind. With regards to Al-Mukhni, to my knowledge, it has not been translated into English, but my choice in relying on it for the Mu'tamad position of the Hanbalis is because it is officially relied upon by the Saudi government. It's a book that actually forms the legal basis of an Islamic country. You can't get any more authoritative than that. I translated the title of al mukhni as The Enrichment. I did so on the basis that in the Qur'an, Allah is referred to as al-ghani, meaning one who is free of need, who is self-sufficient, which is related to the general lexical meaning of ghani to mean rich, wealthy, well-to-do, well-off, affluent, opulent, prosperous. So al muhni can be understood in the uh, all-encompassing idea of enrichment, hence the enrichment. For the Shafi'i school, we'll look at Reliance of the Traveler, also known as Umdat Asalik wa Udat Anasik by Ibn Naqib. For the Maliki school, we'll look at the Judgments of Fiqh, also known as Al Qawanin Al Fiqiyah by Ibn Juzay Al Kalbi. For the Hanafi school, we'll look at The Guidance or Al Hidayah by Al Marhinani. And for the Hanbali school, as already mentioned, we'll be looking at al Murni by Ibn Qudama. With regards to Reliance of the Traveler, consider the letter of approbation by Al-Azhar. Now, that's a little bit hard to read with all the preamble and, and signatories, so I'll zoom into the main part. Quote, to commence, in response to the request you have submitted concerning the examination of the English translation of the book, Umdat Asalik wa Udat Anasik by Ahmad ibn Aqib in the Shafi'i School of Jurisprudence, together with appendices by Islamic scholars on matter of Islamic law, tenets of faith, and personal ethics and character, we certify that the above-mentioned translation corresponds to the Arabic original and conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community, Akhl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. There is no objection to printing it and circulating it, end quote. With regards to the judgments of fiqh, consider its appraisal. Quote, his, i.e. Ibn Juzayl Kalbi, main concern is to say with clarity what the deen, religion, is, and then to note legitimate differences and sometimes illegitimate ones in order to dismiss them. To show the spectrum of valid differences is vitally important in the age of literalism that says Tell me the Sahih Hadith so that I can act on it. Or in its Maliki version, tell me the well-known judgment. Indeed, 
the author carefully lets the reader know the well-known judgments, but sets them within the spectrum of valid judgments from luminaries among Malik's students, such as Ibn al-Qasim, Ashab, Azbah, Ibn Wahab, and Ibn al-Majishun et al., who, it is well to remember, may simply be acting on what they learned from Malik himself, end quote. So one thing you'll notice is that recognition of different opinions does not automatically mean that all opinions are valid. There is this notion in fiqh that certain opinions can be flat out wrong, as the above appraisal says, to note illegitimate differences in order to dismiss them. So modern day Muslim apologists are not at liberty to just pick any historical ruling or opinion they find and claim that it is a legitimate position. With regards to the guidance, Al-Hidayah, consider its appraisal. Quote, The Hidayah has dominated the field of Islamic jurisprudence since the day it was written over 800 years ago. It has been the primary legal text used by Muslim jurists to issue authentic and reliable rulings on Islamic law according to the school of Imam Abu Hanifa. The Hidayah commands such an authoritative position amongst the doctors of law that the knowledge of a scholar who has not read it is not considered reliable. Around 70 huge commentaries, some spread over more than a dozen volumes, have been written on it. The number of explanatory glosses is in the thousands, comprehensive in content and conveniently organized. With the publication of this book, all previous works that discussed Islamic jurisprudence according to Hanafi law became outmoded and soon fell into disuse. If revealed books are not taken into account, never has a book received so much attention as the Hidayah. This landmark publication of the Hidayah not only has been translated in its entirety for the first time, but has been done so from Arabic, the language in which it was written. End quote. You don't write 70 huge commentaries on a book that is not authoritative. You don't write 70 huge commentaries on a book that doesn't represent the school. With regards to al muhni consider the following observation by Dr. Carolyn Bao in her book, Minor Marriage in Early Islamic Law. Quote, In formulating responses to modern issues, Saudi jurists often look to a multi-volume work of positive law called al muhni composed by the 13th century Hanbali jurist Muwaffaq ad-Din ibn Qudama al-Maqdisi, al muhni is one of the six jurisprudential works around which the Saudi legal system is shaped. Not only is it a useful legal history, but it incorporates many now-lost Hanbali legal sources alongside a commentary on an important fiqh work by Abu Qasim al-Khiraqi. End quote. So if you reject reliance of the traveler, then it amounts to rejecting the Shafi'i Madhab. If you reject the judgments of fiqh, then it amounts to rejecting the Maliki Madhab. If you reject the guidance, al-Hidayah, then it amounts to rejecting the Hanafi Madhab. If you reject al-Mughni, then it amounts to rejecting the Hanbali Madhab. If you reject all the Mu'tamad sources, then it amounts to rejecting 14 centuries of scholarship. If that's the case, then you no longer have Islam. You can say you have Quran and Sunnah, but that doesn't mean that you have Islam. The religion of Islam is to be lived. Islam is not the Quran and Sahih al-Bukhari sitting on your bookshelf. Islam is what you do on a daily basis. Everything that you do in your life as a Muslim is an expression of Islam. When you don't have Muslims, 
you don't have Islam. We start our examination of the Mu'tamad positions with the Shafi'i school. Quote, Whenever the bride is a virgin, the father or father's father may marry her to someone without her permission, though it is recommended to ask her permission if she has reached puberty. A virgin's silence is considered as permission. It is obligatory for a woman to let her husband have sex with her immediately when A. He asks her B. At home Home meaning the place in which he is currently staying even if being lent to him or rented C. And she can physically endure it D. Another condition that should be added is that her marriage payment has been received or deferred to a term not yet expired. As for when sex with her is not possible, such that having it would entail manifest harm to her, then she is not obliged to comply. If she asks him to wait, she is awaited to a maximum of three days. She does not ask to wait because of not having finished her period or postnatal bleeding, for there is no physical harm entailed in her complying as she is, though if she fears that such foreplay with him will lead to actual copulation, which is unlawful under such circumstances, then she may refuse, as that is not obligatory. End quote. Now let's see what the Maliki school has. Quote, if someone who is under age but capable of intercourse marries without the permission of his father or guardian, then the latter may permit this or annul it both before and after consummation, and there is no marriage portion for her, while Sahnun has said that it is not permitted even if the father or guardian give permission. End quote. So, in addition to pubescence, what we see here from the Malikis is that pubescent marriage is not restricted to just the female. Males, too, can engage in prepubescent marriage and consummation. Continuing, quote, As for the father, his guardianship is of two types, compulsion and permission. Compulsion being, in the case of a virgin, even if of age, and in the case of the girl who has not reached puberty, even if she is no longer a virgin, having already married. And it is recommended to consult her. As for the commissioned agent of the father and the commissioned agent delegated by the commissioned agent they stand in for and fulfill the contract in place of the father, contrary to Ashafi, and this person may coerce and give away in marriage before and after puberty without consulting the bride if the father has accorded him this mandate and he has precedence over near relations. End quote. Now, notice how it says, in the case of the girl who has not reached puberty, even if she is no longer a virgin having already married. So what does this mean? It is accounting for the situation where a prepubescent girl was married, the marriage was consummated while she was prepubescent, then she was divorced while prepubescent, and then married again, still being prepubescent. Continuing, quote, Living expenses are obligatory for four kinds. One, wives on condition that consummation has taken place and his being assured of being allowed sexual pleasure with her and the husband's being of age and that the wife is capable of sexual intercourse and it is not stipulated that she be of age. While it is also said it is not stipulated that the husband have attained puberty if he is capable of intercourse. End quote. Moving along. Quote, if a girl is divorced, 
after her living expenses have been annulled, then she does not return to her father unless she does so while yet not of age. Let's now see what the Hanafi school has. Quote, The nikah, marriage, of a minor boy or a minor girl is permitted if they are married away by the wali, guardian, irrespective of the girl being a virgin or deflowered. The wali here belongs to the asaba. End quote. We continue with a subsequent section. Thereafter, If the minor girl attains puberty and she has come to know about the nikah, but she remains silent, it will be treated as consent. If she has not come to know about the nikah, she has the option until she does and then falls silent. Thereafter, the option available to a virgin is annulled by her silence, but the option available to a boy is not annulled unless he says, I consent, or he does something that conveys the meaning of consent. The latter rule applies to a girl as well. If her husband had intercourse with her prior to her puberty, the option of puberty For the virgin girl does not extend up to the end of the session, but it is not annulled by moving away from the session in the case of the deflowered girl and a boy. Thereafter, separation resulting from the exercise of the option of puberty is not divorce. If either one of them dies prior to puberty, the other inherits from him or her. So this section in Hanafi Fiqh is talking about the case where the prepubescent girl was married off by her guardian and then she attains puberty. It elaborates what her rights are upon reaching puberty and finding out about the marriage. In other words, the girl only finds out later that she's actually been married this whole time. Upon learning of the marriage, she has the option of annulling it if she is still a virgin. Her keeping silent is her consent to the marriage, and so the marriage continues. But a male does not lose his right to annul the marriage by merely keeping silent. And this type of right that the male has, namely that silence is not to be taken as consent for the marriage to continue, is given to the girl who is not a virgin, meaning that her marriage was consummated while she was still prepubescent. So this is pretty clear. The fiqh establishes two scenarios for a married girl upon reaching puberty, her still being a virgin versus her not being a virgin meaning that her marriage was consummated while she was still prepubescent. Now we move on to the Hanbali school. Dr. Carolyn Bao, a scholar specializing on the topic of minor marriage in Islamic law, highlights what we find in Ibn Qudama's Al-Mughni. The father can give away his prepubescent virgin daughter in marriage against her will, as long as there is a suitable match. Consensus is cited as grounds for the father's ability to compel marriage of his prepubescent virgin daughter, as long as there is a suitable match. Prepubescent marriage is justified on the grounds of the Quran, namely Surah 65 verse 4. Ibn Qudama relies on this verse as proof that the girl's opinion does not need to be taken into consideration. And in this regard, he cites Aisha's situation, wherein she was six years old when married and her opinion was not sought. The marriage between Qudama ibn Mazun and the daughter of Azubair, and the marriage between Umar bin al-Khattab and Umm Kulthum. 
I have personally translated for this presentation the portions of al muhni that Dr. Bao relies on, not having been able to find an already existing English translation. Just as for the commentary from Imam Nawawi, I provide the citation and the original Arabic text so anyone can verify that my translation is indeed faithful to the Arabic original. Ibn Qudama writes the following. If a man wants to marry off his virgin daughter and her marital arrangement is suitable, then the marriage is arranged even though she may dislike it, whether she is pubescent or prepubescent. There is no dispute in this with regards to the prepubescent virgin. Ibn Mundhir said, All the scholars from whom we memorize our lessons in fiqh have agreed that it is permissible for the father to marry off his prepubescent daughter if her husband is suitable, and he may marry her off despite her dislike and abstention. The permissibility of a young girl's marriage is established by the saying of Allah Most High. And those who no longer expect menstruation among your women, if you doubt, then their period is three months, and also for those who have not menstruated. And here he's quoting the Quran, Surah 65, verse 4. So he, Allah, made a waiting period of three months for those who have not menstruated. There can be no waiting period of three months except when there is marital divorce or annulment. So this demonstrates that she married and divorced and her permission was not considered. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said, The Prophet married me when I was six and consummated the marriage when I was nine. There is unanimous agreement on this. It is known that in this circumstance, her permission was not considered. Al-Athram narrated that Qudama bin Mazun was to marry the daughter of Azubair when she was born. He, Qudama bin Mazun, told him, Azubair, if I die, then the daughter of Azubair will inherit from me. But if I live, then she will be my wife. And Ali married off his daughter, Umm Kulthum, who was prepubescent, to Umar bin al-Khattab. May Allah be pleased with them. So basically, what Ibn Qudama is saying here is this. Consider the Quranic verse 65.4. Now, when a divorce happens, the waiting period, or idda, of three months is applicable to a girl who hasn't menstruated, just as it is for women who did at one point menstruate and no longer do. This means that the non-menstruating girl who is divorced is divorced while she is prepubescent. So the first main point here for Ibn Qudama is to establish that prepubescent marriage is permissible. Otherwise, the girl would not be able to be divorced. But now, and here is where the confusion might kick in for some people, Ibn Qudama citing 65.4 is not actually about divorce and edda. Rather, Divorce and Iddah is just a contextual scenario from the Qur'an that demonstrates girls being married while in a prepubescent state. That's what Ibn Qudama is after. His citing the Aisha Hadith, namely her being married at six, i.e. while prepubescent, is also for the purpose of highlighting that Aisha's permission was not sought, as is well known to be the case. Aisha was given away in marriage to Muhammad by her father without her consent. And that is the second point that Ibn Qudama is trying to establish. Namely, that consent is not required for prepubescent marriages. So Ibn Qudama wants us to understand the Quranic verse in light of Aisha's prepubescent marriage in that the marriage of prepubescent girls is one, permissible, and two, does not require consent from the girl. Now let's briefly look at 65.4 from the point of view of the Shafi'i school, which supplements Ibn Qudama. Quote, A waiting period is obligatory for a woman divorced after intercourse, whether the husband and wife are prepubescent, have reached puberty, or one has and the other has not. 
Intercourse means copulation. If the husband was alone with her but did not copulate with her and then divorced her, there is no waiting period. End quote. Now, I'm not going to go into any more details with regards to divorce. The point here is just to illustrate that the permissibility of prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse is readily accounted for in fic, not only when it comes to marriage, but also when it comes to divorce. And the scholars of Islam, the scholars of fiqh, for the last 14 centuries, cite the Qur'an and the Sunnah as evidence. So Muslims cannot say that non-Muslims are reading into the Qur'an or not understanding the Qur'an and Sunnah properly. All of this that I've been quoting from has been from several authentic, highly respected Islamic sources across the four recognized schools. And they're all saying the same thing. Prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse is authentic Islam. Although there might be some nuanced differences, you see great synergy between the schools. They're all more or less on the same page being guided by Allah. As if all this is not enough proof, there are Muslims who will object with a critique aimed at those who cannot understand Arabic. They will say that the Arabic term balugh, which normally means sexual maturity, namely the attainment of puberty, is to be interpreted instead to mean intellectual discernment, by which the Muslim then tries to claim occurs after puberty. The idea being that Aisha was sexually mature because she could intellectually discern. This argument is not valid for the simple reason that the two concepts are explicitly differentiated in fiqh, aql being the proper term referring to intellectual discernment. For example, consider what we find in the Matan of Abu Shuja, also commonly known as the Matan al Ghayat wal Taqrib which is one of the quintessential books on fiqh that every student in the Shafi'i Madhab studies. Three conditions obligate prayer, being Muslim, al-Islam, sexual maturity, al-Bulugh, and intellectual discernment, al-Aql, and this defines legal responsibility, at-Taklif. Four conditions obligate fasting, being Muslim, sexual maturity, intellectual discernment, and having the ability to withstand the fast. Seven conditions obligate Hajj, being Muslim, sexual maturity, intellectual discernment, being a free person, having supplies and means for traveling, safe passage, and ability to travel. Therefore, the possible combinations of Bulugh and Aql are as follows. Sexual immaturity and no intellectual discernment, for example, babies. Sexual immaturity and intellectual discernment, for example, prepubescent children. Sexual maturity and no intellectual discernment, for example, pubescent children and adults with mental retardation or insanity. And sexual maturity and intellectual discernment, for example, normal pubescent children and adults. Musa Ferber helps us understand these various circumstances in his commentary to the text. Quote, The second condition is being sexually mature. Prepubescent children are not required to pray or to make up missed prayers. End quote. Quote, The third condition is being of sound mind. Someone who is insane is not required to pray. End quote. Quote, Young children are not required to fast, though it is valid for them to do so once they reach the age of discernment. Indicators that a child has reached this age include him being able to clean, dress, and feed himself. End quote. Quote, We will frequently see these three conditions, being Muslim, mature, and of sound mind, mentioned together. This is because the combination of these three qualities is the definition of legal responsibility, taklif. End quote. So we see that according to fiqh, 
intellectual discernment is possible while the person is still sexually immature, i.e. prepubescent. Remember how a boy and girl are both given the means to annul their marriage upon reaching puberty? Because now they become mukallaf and are responsible for their own ibadah or worship, marriage being an act of worship according to fiqh. The Muslim argument then that Aisha was sexually mature because she had intellectual discernment is nonsense. Muslims might also try to use a similar argument with regards to the Arabic term sahira, which simply means young girl, but which they might twist to say means an adolescent girl, a girl that has reached sexual maturity yet is still in her teens. This term is used in the commentary quoted previously by Imam Nawawi, and the explanation is clear that who is being referred to is someone that is prepubescent. There is no ambiguity. You also see over and over in the fiqh books, Sahira clearly being used in reference to a prepubescent girl. Moreover, Sahira is contrasted with Kabira, the latter term referring to a girl who has grown up or has reached sexual maturity. So those of you who engage in dialogue with Muslims, if any of them try to make it seem like Sahira means young, but not necessarily prepubescent, call BS. Sahira is a term in fiqh that refers to a prepubescent girl. If Muslims deny all of the proofs presented thus far, then things boil down to two dilemmas for them. One that I call the epistemology dilemma and the other the sharia dilemma. The epistemology dilemma comes about if the authentic Aisha hadith contradicts and is fundamentally irreconcilable with other authentic hadiths and or historical facts. This comes about when Muslims try to rely on other hadiths and historical contexts to prove that Aisha could not have possibly been six when she was married and nine when the marriage was consummated. If this is the position, then it means that usul al-hadith is fundamentally flawed. You can never be 100% certain about a hadith using usul al-hadith. Therefore, usul al-hadith is arbitrary. And as a result, usul al-fiqh is arbitrary because it depends on usul al-hadith. This ultimately means that Allah does not guide the community. These modern-day Muslim apologists are attempting to rewrite and sanitize Islamic history. Some of the explanations put forward include things like Aisha was really 16 instead of 6 and 19 instead of 9. And this can be proven using other hadiths and relying on historical circumstances that supposedly makes it impossible for her at the time to be so young as 6 and 9, respectively. If Aisha was really 16 or 17 when married to Muhammad and 19 when the marriage was consummated, then Aisha engaged in necrophilia because Muhammad died when Aisha was 18. Quote, Aisha, Allah be pleased with her, reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven years old and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine and her dolls were with her. And when he, the Holy Prophet, died, she was 18 years old. End quote. Or perhaps we have to invoke Muslim logic and say that 18 actually means 28. So when the Hadith says Aisha was married at the age of 6 or 7, it really means she was 16 or 17. When the Hadith says that the marriage was consummated when she was 9, it really means she was 19. And when the Hadith says that she was 18 when Muhammad died, it really means 28. We just arbitrarily add 10 years to every date mentioned because why not? So the consequences for Muslims if they reinterpret the Hadith from the way it has always been understood for the last 14 centuries is that 
Allah has not been guiding the Muslim community and that Aisha was a necrophiliac. The Sharia dilemma is this. Either Sharia is divinely ordained and the unanimous Mu'tamad positions of all four Sunni schools, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, Hanbali, are guidance from Allah, or one rejects the Mu'tamad positions of all four Sunni schools and thereby admits that the entire Sunni Muslim Ummah has been misguided for 14 centuries. Taking this latter option means that Sharia is arbitrary, Usul al-Faqh is not reliable, and the entirety of Sunni Islamic law is nonsense. The Sharia dilemma can also be expressed as follows. Usul al-Hadith truly does mean something, Usul al-Faqh truly does mean something, and Allah truly has been guiding the Muslim Ummah for 14 centuries, or you throw away 14 centuries of scholarship because Allah did not guide the Muslim Ummah. You innovate new understandings and you believe whatever you want. To conclude, Aisha was prepubescent when married to Muhammad. Aisha was prepubescent when marriage was consummated. Aisha is used as the basis for establishing fiqh rulings that prepubescent marriage is permissible in Islam. Aisha is used as the basis for establishing fiqh rulings that prepubescent sexual intercourse is permissible in Islam. All four Sunni schools, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, Hanbali, are unanimous that prepubescent marriage is guidance from Allah. All four Sunni schools, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanafi, Hanbali, are unanimous that prepubescent sexual intercourse is guidance from Allah. All of the above has been the understanding of the Sunni Muslim Ummah for 14 centuries. If you reject any of the above, then you either reject Sunni Islam entirely or are in severe deviancy. I started out this presentation saying that I want Muslims to stop lying about prepubescent marriage and prepubescent sexual intercourse in Islam. So on that note, I end this presentation with a plea from within the Muslim Ummah itself. This is Dr. Yasser Qadi admonishing Muslims. And, O Muslims, don't apologize for the truth and don't distort the truth. There are Muslims that try to deny this. Oh, he didn't marry Aisha as a young girl. Yeah, Akhi, look, that's not the way forward. We don't lie for the sake of our religion, astaghfirullah. We have the truth. We're not going to cover up the truth if people find it embarrassing. This is the reality. Deal with it. Oh,